Google. Excellent book. Excellent book. But you can read read my my blog about it. I'm gonna put one up real soon. There's a certain chapter that reminded me about the conversation or the thoughts that I had about man collar and why I started teaching man collar. It's in chapter twenty eight. And in chapter twenty eight, um what he wait what Mr. McDougal is doing is building building on the theory that all human beings were born to run. That it wasn't just our intelligence that made it possible for us to survive with animals out here that were bigger than us that and that could eat with us. That could eat us. That could take our food when they wanted to. That could raid our village and it would take many of us putting our lives on the line to stop this animal. The it wasn't just our intelligence that stopped these animals. It was our ability to run and the endurance that we had that made it possible for us to survive. Um, so going going to chapter 28, he runs, um, another scientist runs into this guy by the name of Louis Lysen, Lysenbenberger. No, Lysenbenberg. Louis Lys Louis Leisbenberg, all right? Now, this guy studied in South Africa um, with, the, um, with, some, with, some, with some brothers out there that hunt because he wanted to, to learn everything that he could about tracking the question, not just tracking, but he, he, his, major, his major thought process was this. He wanted to know why. How in the middle, there was an explosion in the human mind. He wanted to look at how, he wanted to see where the leap, and this is from the book, he wanted to see where the leap from basic survival thinking, like that of other animals, to wildly complicated concepts like logic, humor, deduction, abstract reasoning, and creative imagination come from. He said, okay, so primitive man upgraded his hardware with a bigger brain, but where did we get the software? Growing a bigger brain is, a pro is an organic process, but being able to use that brain to project into the future and mentally connect, say, a kite, a key, and a lightning bolt and come up with the electrical transference was like a touch of magic. So where did that spark come from? That was the question that he asked, and he figured that it came from the ability of human beings to track animals. Now, I also ran into this concept. I ran into this idea while I was reading a book called The Story of B. Um, I can't remember who the author was, but um, the, the name of the book is called The Story of B, I think. And the same concept came across what he was talking about how an uh, individual, how we develop the, the ways of thinking, because it had to be based, it had to come from the survival strategy we used. So he went to the desert and he hooked up with some, with, with some um, people, the desert people of South Africa, and he studied them. And what he discovered was, and I quote, this is what he said, when tracking an animal, one attempts to think like an animal in order to predict where it is going. Lewis says, looking at its tracks, one visualizes the motion of an animal and feel that motion in one's own body. You go into a trance-like state. The con concentration is so intense. It's actually quite dangerous because you become numb to your own body and can keep pushing yourself until you collapse. Visualization, empathy, abstract thinking, and forward projection, aside from the killing over part, isn't that exactly the mental engineering we know we now use for science, medicine, medicine, and creative arts? When you track, you're creating casual concepts in your mind because you didn't actually see what the animal did. Lewis realized that the essence of physics was speculative hunting. Early human hunters had gone beyond connecting the dots. 
they were now connecting dots that existed only in their minds. Now, back to the Marikawa. Since we no longer track animals, our ancestors developed a game where we could follow that same process and develop our thinking because all of the steps that Lewis described in tracking is also done when you play Mancala because you project your future. You, you have to use empathy to feel what your opponent is doing. And we're teaching all these things when we play Mancala. Of course, we're going to expand on that in the future. Um, but that's enough for today. So, you know, I suggest you check out this book and some of the other books that I'm going to be um, talking about in my blog so that you get your mind and your body and your spirit together as a warrior. Be, look, be on the lookout for my, my, my next book, um, Warrior Training. And instead of I'm calling it the Jammy Method, but now the name of the next book is Warrior Training, The Jammy Journey. So why don't you join me? With that, I say peace and stay on top. Peace, the title of uh, today's talk on Jami Radio, Jami Journey Radio is Run. I just completed over this weekend my first um, set in um, running. I've been experimenting with running as a, a method of prayer, um, a method of meditation. So I have a certain amount of miles per week that I'll be running for a little while. Um, as long as my feet and uh, knees uh, hold out. Last time I tried to prepare for a marathon, maybe five to ten years ago, um, I injured myself. So I'm experimenting with um, some of the different aspects of running uh, as far as as close to barefoot as possible. I'm not getting the expensive shoes. Um, just trying to get and, and work with my feet a little bit more and get in shape so that um, I possibly can do a marathon and maybe an ultra marathon in time. But one of the things that I definitely noticed about running is that in the middle of my run, because at first, um, well, this weekend, let me explain. Friday, um, I mean, I've been running all week. I've been running for about three weeks now. Um, earlier... Um, this week, I found uh, a workout that was suggested for anybody that wanted to do a marathon or uh, an ultra marathon. For those that don't know, a marathon is like 26.2 miles, and an ultra marathon is over 50 miles, 50 miles and over. Um, and I'll explain in a second why I would choose to to want to do that. But um, anyway, um, er, I found a workout and. This weekend, I was supposed to knock out 16 miles, something like 8 on Saturday and 8 on Sunday. I was supposed to take a break on Friday. So what I decided to do on Friday night, for those that know, I'm a hookah man. I don't put down most of that hookah. <laughs> that hookah. So, um, you know, that's one of my social pieces. That's one of the things that we meet around as a tribe and stuff. So I decided to jog to the hookah shop, which according to Google, was seven miles away. So on Friday night, I decided to do a test run and jog to the hookah place. I basically was wearing a pair of socks, you know, with pads on the bottom. Um, I ran, just happened to snow that day, so it was pretty cold, but that run was pretty easy. But I came up with the thought that at mile three, just like in fasting on day three, it's all the same. And I thought that. I was pretty confident in that. But the next day, I was supposed to run 14 miles. And I planned out my course. But along the way, you know, I talked myself into taking shortcuts. Now, the first rule, the first thing I figured out, and I'm going to use this for the rest of my life, there is no shortcuts in the long run. Don't fool yourself. There's no shortcuts in the long run. So I decided to take some shortcuts. And even though I didn't make it to the destination that I was plotting to make it to, which was supposed to be 14 miles away, by the time I got done running, 
I had been running for almost three hours and covered 18 miles. I'm like, well, you know, so my feet swelling up, my legs was hurting, and about mile 10, I ran into, I guess, the doubt demon. And one of the reasons that I originally started running was because I needed some way to put myself through a test. I needed some way to, in, in, in the healthiest way possible, bring myself through a process of personal development by pushing myself to limits. I've always done that, whether I'm doing it through the sweat lodge or whether I'm doing it with the simple circle, or whether I'm doing it with Jiami. I'm always trying to find things to push myself to the edge. Running is one of those things that I can indulge in that allows me to push myself to my limits and and not necessarily die. I mean, although you feel like you're coming close to it at a certain time, um, it it's, 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 it's a way where you can get in touch with that divine in you, that, 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 that power within you. But first you got to make it through that doubt, demon, the thing that pops up and be like, man, why are you running? You know what I'm saying? Why don't you stop? Why don't you just stop, man? You stop now. You be cool. Don't worry about it, blah, blah, blah. You know, I had a certain amount of miles that I wanted to make. And right before I got to where I needed to be, my phone started ringing and, and, and the doubt started talking to me and the questions start rising up in my head and I thought it was the same as in fasting because on day three of a fast for me all days are the same you know what I'm saying I mean I could go I feel as if I could go forever and it felt like that on mile three but damn I forgot about mile six and mile nine and especially mile ten you know what I'm saying as, as these clicks start going off you know the doubt start building up about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And, and during those times, I was able really to focus on my personal meditation and my prayer. So I'm suggesting this for all Giami people. You know, Giami, from this point on, we are running people now. You know what I'm saying? Because running allows us to push ourselves to our limits. You know what I'm saying? In a healthy way. It allows us to push ourselves to the limit and really see what's inside of us because there's very few things that happen in this world today that forces you to have to really run into you, run and face you. Everything in this world is designed on allowing you to escape facing you. Running, there's no escaping you. Even if you're running with people, eventually you're going to hit a point inside yourself where the doubt comes. And this goes back to a story that an elder told me, and, and I'll be done with this portion. An elder told me one time that he uh, used to race cars, and I think I told some of you this story. And he said, you know, during a 500-mile race, there was a point in time, he said, after the 100th mile that was called the Lonely Miles, that at that point in time, you was really forced to face yourself. And he told me this story because I asked him about an umbleja or a vision quest. And he said, during the vision quest, you were from running to, just like in racing cars and just like running, those lonely miles where you by yourself and you're faced to deal with yourself, where you didn't thought all your th thoughts out. Believe you me, when you up on your feet bouncing for three hours, and now I'm talking about moving to five hours. And then I'm talking about moving to ten hours. And I'm talking about moving to 15 hours of running straight on your feet. You run out of little fancy things. You, you run out of questions. You, you run out of com conversations with yourself. You know what I'm saying? And the miles become lonely and, and can, perceived, can be perceived as empty. But those people that are able to embrace those lonely miles are the ones that's able to really develop themselves and become better people. And that's what I'm trying to push towards, and hopefully you can push towards that. So keep up with my blog, keep up with my um, radio spot. We're going to be doing more talks, and I'm going to be talking to you as I go through my process of learning, my process of dieting, my process of other exercises. All right, and with that, I say peace. Here's the Jeremy Pledge.
for those that never heard it. I am a Jiami man. I was born for greatness. My greatness comes from my potent center. I pledge to find and connect with my center. I pledge to build my spirit, mind, and body. I pledge to use my hands to build a better world for myself, my loved ones, and my community. I pledge to use my mind to think deeper, further, and higher to create a better reality for myself. I pledge to live my life and go beyond all my self-imposed limitations. I pledge to promote the principles of a Jiami warrior and to assist all those who are seeking the path of success. I pledge all these things first to myself, my teachers, to all my relations, and to all my and to my higher power. I am Jiami. I say, I say, I say. That should be said once a day for all those Jiami warriors. And with that, I say peace. At Jewelers Mutual, we're a little obsessed with jewelry. Obsessed like auctioneers with talking fast. Fifty, we're gonna fit so. Pop stars with auto tune. Yeah, 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 yeah. And dentists with asking questions. So, how did he propose? After they put their hands in your mouth. Great. Yes, we've made jewelry our obsession for over 100 years. We love it so much we named our kids Ruby, Amber, and Opal. Venti soy latte for Opal. At Jewelers Mutual, we insure jewelry and only jewelry, which is why people who are also obsessed with jewelry trust us with theirs. This is Brother Hotel. I'm out on my run. I'm about mile three. Of course, you know, if you've been following the journey, uh, I have a workout that will release a 360 mile quest that I'm challenging my readers as well as my tribe members to participate in. You know, in the background, you lose the cars, we're scared. Also, it's in mile four. And what was supposed to be a half an hour run, but now I'm at about 33 minutes. But while I was running, I was running, I was falling, I was falling to a balanced state. What a lot of people would call a trance. It's your body working, your mind, you set free, a lot of problems that you got, a lot to just drift. Because you can't really necessarily focus on them because of the run, because of the physical output. So, while I was running, I started thinking about this article or this next piece that we're about to talk about right now. It's called Attitude Adjustment. Now, working with some pretty brilliant people, you know, and know, I've been truly blessed. But one of the things that I have noticed in my short 43 years is that attitude, our attitude determines how, how high and how far we go. Why is this? This is because our attitude is what attracts or pushes or repels people away from us. Now, majority of my life, I have been blessed with some excellent relationships. And these relationships were built and are maintained by the fact that I have a good attitude, or at least I perceive that I have a good attitude. And it's been working for me. And I keep on experimenting with it because, because, it has demonstrated to me and for me this fact. It demonstrates that it works. This ain't conjecture. This ain't theory. All my jobs in my life have come as a product of my relationships. And all my relationships have become come out of come out of the fact of my attitude. So one of the things I think that we really need to focus on is helping each other with our attitudes. Now, this is the Achilles heel for most people. This is a weak spot. This is a sucker point because most people can't see 
the attitude. All they see is the result of the attitude. And after a while, they get used to the result because they figure this is how life is. When in fact, their life is a result of the attitude that they reflect it. So, they need help. They need for us or people outside. We need help. We need for people outside of us to be honest with us about our attitude. And we need to be able to take it. We need to be able to listen and make adjustments if we feel that it's going to take our lives to another level. The issue, the issue is, you could be brilliant. You could be fabulous. You could be marvelous. You could be the next George Washington Carver or have the oratory skills of Marcus Garvey, Martin Luther King, and uh, Obama all rolled up in one. But if your attitude is fucked up, you are going nowhere. So we need to be in the, we need to be people's mirrors. We need to let them know. And those of us that really want to take the time to explore ourselves, we need to look at how people respond to us. Those who we like and those who we don't like. We need to take the feedback and grow. And drop those attitudes that's working against our survival. Because we're coming to a point where relationships are what are not only going to keep you safe, but they're going to keep you alive. And if you are isolating yourself and your family with your stank attitude, you need to correct it now before it's too late. This is Brother High Tim with Johnny Talks. And today's topic is adjusting your attitude. I'm on my four. And I'm praying for myself and all those that's listening. With that, I say I say. Peace. This is Brother Hot Tim. And this segment is called On Mile 3. Let me say that again. I'm on mile three. And thoughts hit me when I'm on mile three. Now, of course, those that's been following the journey know that I have a 360-mile quest. It's a challenge to see if in a year's time you could cover over 360 miles in your journey to itself. Now, let me make this clear. The workout that we're talking about, I don't want the boring workouts. I don't want the workouts when you ain't having fun and it's all pain and gain. I want you to really get involved with your exercise. I want you to take time during the time that you're doing your quiz and really seek answers in your life. When you run this, it gives you time to think about what's going on. When you go to Rosie, it gives you time to focus on you and how your body moves. It allows you to find your personal rhythm. This is a spiritual quest. Although using physical means is a spiritual quest that you can use to, within a year, make major, major changes in your life. So, come on the quest with me. So, I'm going to be checking in every now and then, giving inspiration and talking about some of the thoughts that come across my mind as I'm trying to meditate and pray. Now, one of the things that I'm going to suggest is that when you have problems in your life, that individual people pops up in your meditation or your prayer, is to take a moment, reflect, don't get involved with the thoughts, and whether it's negative or positive about what you're thinking, send that person a prayer. Send, pray for that person. And pray for yourself to be able to forgive. Because when we 
knock him off these miles, and knock him off those clouds, and knock him off that pain. In order for us to change, we have to let some of the old stuff go. All right? So once again, this is how Tim talking to you about the 360-mile quest challenge. You can join me on GiannoJourney.blogspot.com and get your form, fill it out in the morning, and check out the data as it grow. And look at your progression. Look at your miles and your time increase each time you add. So, on to my thought of the day. Oh, by the way, my, my quest is fueled by oxy water. Check it out. Oxy water. Now, here we go. Entitlement. As I was running today, and also, last night, as I stopped getting at the hookah shop to meet with one of my advisors, one of my friends, to talk about life, one of the major issues that popped up and been with me all night is this issue of entitlement. And it kind of fit into the piece that I did earlier called Attitude Adjustment. Because when people, for some reason, when people feel they are entitled, they lose the sense of gratitude. They lose the kindness that human relationships thrive on. And as a matter of fact, I think entitlement may, for some people, off their path, off their journey, because when you are entitled, you don't have to necessarily work for what you get. You get things free because you deserve it, or laws say you deserve it, or appearance say you deserve it. So the thing that we are entitled to, and the people that give us the things that we feel we're entitled to, we sometimes take for granted. We don't look at the fact that entitlement is totally a man-made law. It's not necessarily a law that's out of the nature. A lion is not entitled to a potato. A farmer is not entitled to a good crop. Hell, you're not entitled to another day of life. So to run them off and get entitlement and treat the people, everything you get entitled with is something not valuable. Not only destroys your character, but it destroys the institutions that's providing the entitlements. Now, I think what may even be worse than a person who feel that they are entitled, maybe the person who feels that they are entitled to give, they have the right to give, even though they don't have the resources or the know-how to give. Now, one of the major entitlement pieces that I'm dealing with is education. Education is from kindergarten to twelfth grade an entitlement. Could it be that a lot of our kids, especially ones I'm working with, hopefully some of y'all are working with a different population and can give me hope. But maybe because because education is entitled, is not valued by the children. Or the parents. Let's go in and do it. How about forgiveness? Or the love of a parent? If I feel that I'm inside of children, then I may not do what's necessary for me to recuperate or to pay back their love. Entitlement is false. Entitlement destroys. 
No, I do know people do do need help. And I chose to live my life and give people help. But one of the things that I have done is when I went into an entitlement person, I step away. If I can, I only do it. Because when they feel they're entitled, they not only will destroy themselves, if you're not giving them what they feel they deserve, they will try to destroy you. This is when I have two, and I'm at high three. And I'll talk to you soon. With that, I say peace. This is Reverend Hot Tim coming with another installment of On My Three. I'm on my third mile, and tonight I'm eating about six cooks for a few or six miles for dinner, and I'm chasing it down with a bottle of ice water. You know what I mean? Jenny is fueled by ice water. Now, let's get this topic in hand. First off, I'd like to welcome all those who have joined me on the 360 mile quest challenge. That's right. That's right. I'm getting them in. I'm getting them in. You know, tomorrow I'm going to look up the health benefits of at least 200 miles a day, or 7 miles a week, or 30 miles a month. Let's see how big of a difference. It can measure we make in a person's life. And not only physically, but of course, I'm always looking at the mental and the spiritual side. So, on to the talk of the day, or in this three mile piece. Now, the noise in the background, excuse me, I'm running, and I'm out here on Cleveland Avenue. So, listen close. But, I do want you to notice this. I'm not as out of breath as I was on my earlier shoots. In a minute, I'm going to do my three, just like I was sitting, just like if I was sitting still. But I got to be dedicated. I got to be focused. I got to make make it happen. All right, talk of the day. Talk of the day. Here we go. Now. A while ago, I wrote a blog called Make It Happen. It's a story, and I'm going to get into that. But also, I did a haiku about the economic system. I wrote about the economic system. And then, and then the haiku, I basically said that we no longer was an economy that needed people to work jobs. We were an economy for entrepreneurs. There's an economy that needs people looking for jobs. It needs people making jobs. Now this was real force today because before I took my run, the financial consultant that be on PBS was on a talk show and she basically said the same thing. So, I want to talk about that a little bit. And it kind of fits in line with what we've been talking about. The relationships, the attitudes, all that. So, here we go. Now, a while ago I wrote a story called Make It Happen. And this relation for that story was a Star Trek Enterprise movie or in Star Trek The Next Generation. In there, you have an order where you have a captain, you have what's called as number one, or the second in command, you have the security officer, then the service officer. You have an order in that thing. And each of those individuals are geniuses. And they work as one night. Now the captain just happens to be the brain. And one thing that he always says, when they came to a decision, was make it so. Make it so. In the streets, 
we say, make shit happen. Same concept. Same concept. And that's the mind state that we have to start producing to get out of this economic slump. We got to make shit happen. Long ago, it's a time where individuals could work 30 years and retire. Long ago, it is the promise that going to college will make you a success. Long ago, all those things. The one thing that's guaranteed is that we live in a time of turmoil, we live, live in a time of change. And those people who have historically given things, who have historically taken the records of these type of times, have been entrepreneurs. Now, this is what I want to say. We make shit happen. Making it so. A true hustler, a true hustler, and it doesn't have to be negative, a true hustler could make shit happen with absolutely nothing. I want you to think about that. A true hustler, no matter how bad the times are, no matter what the government is doing, will always make something happen. Always. Whether it's illegal or legal. And that spirit is what we need to harness here today. Think about this. We got these presidential debates going on. And one of the major issues that I'm hearing about is jobs. Now, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but I know government is not in a position to create jobs. As a matter of fact, all the jobs that the government creates are draining the economy that they need. When they create a job, that means they have to raise taxes to pay for that job. Which means those people who don't work for the government get to pay higher taxes, which make life harder for everybody. Now, a true customer, somebody that makes it so, somebody that makes shit happen, it don't matter what the government do. So, forget what the Democrats are saying, forget what the Republicans are saying, because government can do nothing but lay down basic laws. And mostly the people are follow. But the true hustler, regardless of whether the interest rates are high or extremely low, regardless of whether the rates are rolling or not, a true hustler makes shit happen. And this is what I'm putting on you. What are you making happen in your life? With this 360 mile challenge quest, you have an opportunity to make shit happen in your life. It ain't nothing but getting up running a mile. But let me tell you this, that you run a mile, who knows what problem you saw in your life? So how you doing? So keep on listening, keep on pushing, keep getting your miles in, keep getting your meditations in, keep keeping all the meaning. Because what I want to do is I'm going to put the statistics up on the blog so people can see how we progressing as a group as far as reaching our miles. So with that, we're going to have Jim. Peace. Mm -hmm. Gianni Gianni and a 360 mile course is powered by Oxywell, which I'm going to follow this run up with. So with that, I say peace. What's up now? This brother Hotel. As you hear, once again, I'm on mile three. And I am high. Spiritual high. Because my ankle has been bothering me and it's not bothering me right now. I've been adjusting my style and reading books trying to perfect my method. Uh 
and since doing what I'm about to talk to you about and create my own thing, listen, I have a book of wisdom that I often refer to, and it's called The African Openings to the Tree of Life. You can look it up, you can find it, there's only one publisher that produces it, but if you follow my blog, Peace, this is this brother out there with Jeremy Talks. I'm sitting here with two of my elders. Um, going to break it down a little bit about Simba and um, the future, um, as well as the present. Maybe we might even get to some of the past of Simba. Um, I'm sitting here with uh, Elder Gaylord Thomas, Elder Cedric Sanders, and um Peace. This is Mr. This is Brother Hatim. I'm stepping in late night, got the assignment and started thinking. And uh, right now I'm going to take some time to go over the three levels of learning for some of the uh, warriors and people that's coming on. Um, this is going to be a chapter in my next book, which will be called Warrior Training. And uh, Warrior Training, the Geometry Method. So, in Jami Warrior, in in the Nation Builder idea, we teach and talk about constantly the three levels of learning. And it's important that everybody that comes into organization learns to deal with and through the three levels of learning. We believe and we know from actual application that by understanding these three levels of learning and understanding the process that go with the three levels of learning, it makes it possible for the person that practices this to learn anything. So for us, the three levels of learning are very simple. First one is called memorization. Memorization is the basic level. A monkey can do it. A dog can do it. All basic animals can learn through memory. Um, in memorization, we look at things and we try to remember them as they are. We, in a sense, scribe them. This is what we call the process in, in Giamme. We call it scribing, where an individual may look at some questions because we prescribe, we give each individual a certain amount of questions that they need to learn verbatim. They need to learn the question and they also need to learn the answer verbatim by memory exactly as it is taught to them. So they have to learn how to scribe. They have to learn how to write what they see exactly as it is and learn how to recite what it is that they are supposed to know exactly as it is. We call that scribing and that's the first level of learning, memorization. The next level is called the intelligence of the mind. With the intelligence of the mind, what this means is now the things that you have memorized, you are now able to digest them and make them your own in a sense. You are able to go a little bit deeper in thought with these concepts, with these ideas. It means that you are able to really look at it and start asking yourself and other pe people questions that help you go a little bit deeper with the questions. For example, one of the questions is, what is a warrior? 
A warrior is one who is experienced or involved in conflict. That's the verbatim. What we want people to do is to be able to look at that question, look at that answer, and go a little bit deeper with it. What other questions come out of what is a warrior? One of the major questions that come out of what is a warrior is, if a warrior is one experienced and involved in conflict, does that mean that a warrior only deals with the physical aspect of war? The answer, of course, would be no. And then the next question would be, well, could a mathematician be a warrior? A mathematician actually is a warrior. So it takes the conversation a little bit deeper. It's intelligence in the mind. So now I could play with these concepts in my mind. And I could build on them. And I could build with other people and I could learn. But this is not the highest level of learning. Actually, this is the only for us, this is the second level. Now we got to go to the third level. The third level is where, in a sense, we forget everything that we learn. We have digested it. It is ours now. So I no longer have to have a debate about it. I no longer have to share the concept. People can look at me and not need to hear the definition of a warrior because they will see it in how I am, in my way of being. So the last step of learning is intelligence of the heart. Now we'll go a little bit more into that later on, but um, or, or on another on another disc. Now the key piece that I want to tie this into is this, because late night I'm sitting up here and I'm thinking. When we talk about these levels of learning, we need to go ahead and equate these also with the three parts of the human mind. The three different ways we learn because, and, and I'm going to make this very brief because I know, y'all, we have short attention spans out here, and I want to make sure you get this. But according to the studies that I have run into, the human mind is composed of three parts. In psychology, you have it, but physically, the human mind or the brain, the actual brain, not the mind, is composed of three parts. You had a reptilian brain, you had a mammalian brain, and you also have that part of our brain which is the newest part, that, 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 that human part that has recently developed in, 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 in our history or in, in the lifespan of the human being or that, the newest part of our brain. So you got at the core, you have this reptilian part that is basically, basically wired for survival. Basic survival. On top of that part of the brain, you had a mammalian brain, which is basically, it takes survival just a little bit differently. Yes, it's based on survival, but it's also looking for comfort, and it's also looking for food, and of course it's looking for sex, which makes survival a little bit more enjoyable. I want to survive, but I want to be a little bit more comfortable, you know what I'm saying? I want to make sure I got a steady source of food, you know what I'm saying? So the mammalian brain takes care of that. Then the last part of our brain makes us human. It's the part of us that allows us to think. Now, how does this equate with the three levels of learning? Of course not, but, and most of y'all probably will not understand this for a second. The memorization part, the memorization part is not designed to get into the reptilian part of the brain. It is designed to get at that human part of the brain, the newest part of the brain. Because it's best at memorization. Because really when it comes down to it, whenever we make major decisions in our lives, we base it on survival and emotions, which is controlled by the reptilian brain. So the first level of learning is not designed to get to the reptilian part of the brain. It's designed to train the human part of us. Now, the next level of learning or intelligence of the mind is designed for the mammalian part of the brain. Now, when I take these concepts and I play with them and I, and I think about them deeply and I work with them, it allows me to give them the emotional charge. Once I really embrace them, once I really understand them, they become my concepts and I become emotionally charged with this information. I emotionally charge this information and these ideas, which allows it ultimately to get 
inside of the reptilian brain, which helps me live what it is I know, which makes sure I live what I know because I base my survival on the concepts that I have. Now, prime example, I work in the school with, with, with kids and every day we give them, we, we, we talk them through a process to which to deal with conflict and every child from kindergarten all the way up to the eighth grade know the steps to dealing with violence. The first thing is that if somebody is bothering you, you ask them to stop. Then you tell them to stop. Then you, uh, then, then you remove yourself from the situation. And lastly, you, if, if all else fails, you ask or you tell a teacher or the nearest adult. Every last one of our kids know this mentally. They got it memorized. Now, but the, my question was tonight, which, which caused me to kind of stay up, is we know information as adults. We know information as kids. We got things memorized. Why can't we act on what it is we got memorized? And then this reptilian part of the brain, I mean, basically the idea of the reptilian part of the brain hit me. And then the three levels came out and came back and slapped me in the face and said, look, Hakim, the major reason that people are not able to act on the information that they have, whether they're adults or children, is because although they got it memorized, they have not made it their own. They have not emotionally charged it so that it can in so that it can become part of them so that they can live it. So if I got my children just reciting something without them investing that emotional charge into what they're saying, and if I'm not really discussing it with them so that they can really look at it from many different angles and learn to grasp it and digest it for themselves. It don't matter because basically all they're going to be doing is just being a, they're just going to be able to recite what it is we want them to say and what they're supposed to say, but they're not going to be able to act on information. And that's the same for adults. So looking at the three levels of learning, it's very important that every warrior understands these three levels and start applying and start looking at these three levels in your life. If you want to make change in your life and you know that something you are doing is unhealthy for you and you know something is not good for you and there's something that you want to change and you got all the facts, could it be that you are not changing your behaviors because you have not taken it through the three major steps of learning? You got it memorized, but have you really explored the idea? Have you really asked the questions that need to be asked? Have you really emotionally charged the idea so that now not only do you know it, but you become it? This is Brother Hatim. I'd like to thank you for your time and your patience. And with that, I say peace. If you got any questions, feel free to hit me up because my radio is on my blog. The name of my blog is giamijourney.blogspot.com. I also got giamijourney.com. You can hit me up. Um, this is Brother Hatim, once again, representing the Giamme Urban Warriors. I'm representing the Giamme Tribe. So feel free to hit me up with questions. Feel free to challenge me. I don't care. My my thing is I want to get people thinking, period. So if you agree with me, throw some thoughts at me. If you disagree with me, throw some thoughts, throw some ideas at me so that we I can wrestle with the concept. And if you are right, I can start asking those questions that will maybe change my path and maybe change my life. So with that, once again, I say peace. You have a beautiful day or night or whatever time it is. It's early in the morning for me. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. So until I say peace. Peace. This is Brother Ha Tim of the Jeremy Tribe. <clears throat> um, today we're going to talk about why 
We teach DMP play man collar. For those who are listening and don't un, don't know what the game man collar is, you could Google it and look it up. It's one of the oldest games in the world, and one of the major reasons we focus on teaching this game is that it teaches the warrior about strategy. It teaches them how to outthink an opponent. It teaches them how to pick out patterns um, in space and time while engaging in the activity so that they could make predictions of what an opponent will do in the future. Um, it teaches us how to count um, rapidly. It teaches us how to take advantage of the moment and how to embrace the moment. It's a form of moving meditation, which is um, the next step, I think, for uh, humans. Actually, it's a step backwards for humans as far as meditation because for years I've been meditating, but one of the things that, that has always been the hardest for me is just sitting still, not to sit still with some of the best of them, but um, I'm seeing that there's something different needed. So far as the Giammi development, the Giammi program, um, as far as getting the warriors in shape mentally, physically, as well as spiritually, we're going to be looking at some different alternatives. And man, color is one of these alternatives. And what we do in what we do is we are setting up competitions between young folks and older folks using this game as the centerpiece because not only does it teach the things that I, I said earlier, it also promotes some growth between the generations, you know, kind of trying to eliminate this false sense of a generation gap because with this game, all things become even because all my experience of playing it, because I've been playing the game for over 20 years. Um, as a matter of fact, me and my friends, we came up with a method that we call the underground method that will be the way people play in our tournaments, the way we play in Giami is something, is a, is a personal way that we develop. I'm quite sure other people play it like this, but what we did was we looked at the game. We looked at the game in as many different versions, and we took the parts out of different games that we felt worked best and kept the game exciting for us. So we call this the underground method. And I'm teaching it right now at um, a school at a school that I work at um, to the young people. And I'm also teaching it to the Giami Warriors, and I will eventually teach it to um, some of the symbols that I work with as well so that we've got a national body of people that's playing this game in a certain way. We could play it other ways but when we come together we're going to play it in our way this way we take ownership of and and we build on and we create but this game is one of the oldest games in the world and what it teaches is 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 phenomenal because when you start seeing kids who have been told that they're not good at math pick up a game in, in a matter of weeks and then beat you it's a beautiful thing it's a beautiful, it hurts your pride, it, it, it smashes your ego, which is good. But when you see the, the light in these kids' eyes and you see the light in these young people's eyes and you see the lights in the eyes of individuals that come who, who were told they didn't have good thinking abilities and they master this game and they pick up these patterns and they see how you're going to do and they're able to predict your move and they're able to predict how many shells is going to be in a certain hole at a certain time so that they could do what's called a shock move. You know that you know that something deeper is going on. But now the major reason that I wanted to do this talk, because I, I, I'm, I'm bringing it home, is I was reading a book called Born to Run, and uh, check into my blog because I'm going to be doing um, – um, uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking about this book, Born to Run, and a few other books because I'm about to take Giammi Journey in um, in a different direction. I've been taking a break so that I can get my mind together. I'm going to continue writing in the way I'm writing. I'm going to continue covering the things I'm covering. But now I'm getting more into the training aspect. I want to help people truly on their journey. I've been dropping some of my ideas and stuff, but I'm going to get a little bit more fine-tuned with my ideas so that somebody in Asia that wanted to be Giamme could participate in the tribe, you know what I'm saying, and be able to pick up on 
the lessons and we be able to identify each other in the airport just in our conversation because they have embraced some of the ideas, um, have taken it deeper. Um, because you heard in my last talk where I talked about um, the three levels of learning. The second level of learning, you learn to possess the idea until the idea, in a sense, possesses you and becomes part of you. So that's where I'll, that's that's the information I'm gonna be dropping. But in this book, Born to Run by Christopher McDougal, excellent book, excellent book. But you could read read my my blog about. It. I'm gonna put one up real soon. There's a certain chapter that reminded me about the conversation or the thoughts that I had about man collar and why I started teaching man collar. It's in chapter 28, and in chapter 28, um, what he wait what Mr. McDougal is doing is building building on the theory that all human beings were born to run. That it wasn't just our intelligence that made it possible for us to survive with animals out here that were bigger than us that and that could eat with us, that could eat us, that could take our food when they wanted to, that could raid our village and it would take many of us putting our lives on the line to stop this animal. The, it wasn't just our intelligence that stopped these animals. It was our ability to run and the endurance that we had that made it possible for us to survive. Um, so going going to Chapter 28, he runs, um, another scientist runs into this guy by the name of Louis Leisen, Leisenbenberger. No, Leisenbenberg. Louis Lis Louis Leisbenberg, all right? Now, this guy studied in South Africa um, with, the, um, with, some, with, some, with some brothers out there that hunt because he wanted to, to learn everything that he could about tracking the quest, not just tracking, but he, he, his, major, his major thought process was this. He wanted to know why. It how in the moment there was an explosion in the human mind. He wanted to look at how, he wanted to see where the leap, and this is from the book, he wanted to see where the leap from basic survival thinking, like that of other animals, to wildly complicated concepts like logic, humor, deduction, abstract reasoning, and creative imagination come from. He said, okay, so primitive man upgraded his hardware with a bigger brain, but where did we get the software? Growing a bigger brain is a pro is an organic process, but being able to use that brain to project into the future and mentally connect, say, a kite, a key, and a lightning bolt, and come up with the electrical transference was like a touch of magic. So where did that spark come from? That was the question that he asked, and he figured, that it came from the ability of human beings to track animals. Now, I also ran into this concept. I ran into this idea while I was reading a book called The Story of B. Um, I can't remember who the author was, but um, the, the name of the book is called The Story of B, I think. And the same concept came across what he was talking about how an uh, individual, how we develop the, the ways of thinking, because it had to be based, it had to come from the survival strategy we used. So he went to the desert and he hooked up with some, with, with some um, people, the desert people of South Africa, and he studied them. And what he discovered was, and I quote, this is what he said, when tracking an animal, one attempts to think like an animal in order to predict where it is going. Lewis says, looking at his tracks, one visualizes the motion of an animal and feel that motion in one's own body. You go into a trance-like state. The con concentration is so intense it's actually quite dangerous because you become numb to your own body and can keep pushing yourself until you collapse. 
visualization, empathy, abstract thinking, and forward projection, aside from the killing over part, isn't that exactly the mental engineering we know we now use for science, medicine, medicine, and creative arts? When you track, you're creating casual concepts in your mind because you didn't actually see what the animal did. Lewis realized that the essence of physics was speculative hunting. Early human hunters had gone beyond connecting the dots. They were now connecting dots that existed only in their minds. Now, back to the Mancala. Since we no longer track animals, our ancestors developed a game where we could follow that same process and develop our thinking because all of the steps that Lewis described in tracking is also done when you play Mancala because you project your future. You, you have to use empathy to feel what your opponent is doing. And we're teaching all these things when we play Mancala. Of course, we're going to expand on that in the future. Um, but that's enough for today. So, you know, I suggest you check out this book and some of the other books that I'm going to be um, talking about in my blog so that you get your mind and your body and your spirit together as a warrior. Be, look, be on the lookout for my, my, my next book, um, Warrior Training. And instead of I'm calling it the Jammy Method, but now nah, the name of the next book is Warrior Training, The Jammy Journey. So why don't you join me? With that, I say peace and stay on top. Peace. The title of uh, today's talk on Jami Radio, Jami Journey Radio, is Run. I just completed over this weekend my first um, set in um, running. I've been experimenting with running as a, a method of prayer, um, a method of meditation. So I have a certain amount of miles per week that I'll be running for a little while. Um, as long as my feet and uh, knees uh, hold out. Last time I tried to prepare for a marathon, maybe five to ten years ago, um, I injured myself, so I'm experimenting with um, some of those different aspects of running, as uh, far as as close to barefoot as possible. I'm not getting the expensive shoes. Um, just trying to get and, and work with my feet a little bit more and get in shape so that um, I possibly can do a marathon and maybe an ultra marathon in time. One of the things that I definitely noticed about running is that in the middle of my run, because at first, um, well, this weekend, let me explain. Friday, um, I mean, I've been running all week. I've been running for about three weeks now. Um, earlier um, this week, I found uh, a workout that was suggested for anybody that wanted to do a marathon or uh, an ultra marathon. For those that don't know, a marathon is like 26.2 miles, and an ultra marathon is over 50 miles, 50 miles and over. Um, and I'll explain in a second why I would choose to to want to do that. But um, anyway, um, er, I found a workout, and this weekend I was supposed to knock out 16 miles, something like 8 on Saturday and 8 on Sunday. And I was supposed to take a break on Friday. So what I decided to do on Friday night, for those that know, I'm a hookah man. I don't put down most of that. I don't give up that hookah. So, um, you know, that's one of my social pieces. That's one of the things that we meet around as a tribe and stuff. So I decided to jog to the hookah shop, which, according to Google, was seven miles away. So on Friday night, I decided to do a test run and jog to the hookah place. I basically was wearing a pair of socks, you know, with pads on the bottom. Um, I ran, just happened to snow that day, so it was pretty cold, but that run was pretty easy. But I came up with the thought that at mile three, just like in fasting on day three, it's all the same. And I thought that. I was pretty confident in that. 
But the next day, I was supposed to run 14 miles, and I plot out my course, but along the way, you know, I talked myself into taking shortcuts. Now, the first rule, the first thing I figured out, and I'm going to use this for the rest of my life, there is no shortcuts in the long run. Don't fool yourself. There's no shortcuts in the long run. So I decided to take some shortcuts. And even though I didn't make it to the destination that I was plotting to make it to, which was supposed to be 14 miles away, by the time I got done running, I had been running for almost three hours and covered 18 miles. I'm like, oh, you know, so my feet swelling up, my legs was hurting, and about mile 10, I ran into, I guess, the doubt demon. And one of the reasons that I originally started running was because I needed some way to put myself through a test. I needed some way to, in, in, in the healthiest way possible, bring myself through a process of personal development by pushing myself to limits. I've always done that, whether I'm doing it through the sweat lodge or whether I'm doing it with the symbol circle or whether I'm doing it with Giamme. I'm always trying to find things to push myself to the edge. Running is one of those things that I can indulge in that allows me to push myself to my limits and and not necessarily die. I mean, although you feel like you're coming close to it at a certain time, um, it it's, 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 it's a way where you can get in touch with that divine in you, that, 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 that power within you. But first, you've got to make it through that doubt, demon, the thing that pops up and be like, man, why are you running? You know what I'm saying? Why don't you stop? Why don't you just stop, man? You stop now. You be cool. Don't worry about it, blah, blah, blah. You know, I had a certain amount of miles that I wanted to make. And right before I got to where I needed to be, my phone started ringing and, and, and the doubt started talking to me and the questions start rising up in my head and I thought it was the same as in fasting because on day three of a fast for me all days are the same you know what I'm saying I mean I could go I feel as if I could go forever and it felt like that on mile three but damn I forgot about mile six and mile nine and especially mile ten you know what I'm saying as, as these clicks start going off you know the doubt start building up about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And, and during those times, I was able really to focus on my personal meditation and my prayer. So I'm suggesting this for all Giammi people. You know, Giammi, from this point on, we are running people now. You know what I'm saying? Because running allows us to push ourselves to our limits. You know what I'm saying? In a healthy way. It allows us to push ourselves to the limit and really see what's inside of us because there's very few things that happen in this world today that forces you to have to really run into you, run and face you. Everything in this world is designed on allowing you to escape facing you. Running, there's no escaping you. Even if you're running with people, eventually you're going to hit a point inside yourself where the doubt comes. And this goes back to a story that an elder told me, and, and I'll be done with this portion. An elder told me one time that he uh, used to race cars, and I think I told some of y'all this story. And he said, you know, during a 500-mile race, there was a point in time, he said, after the 100th mile that was called the Lonely Miles, that at that point in time, you was really forced to face yourself. And he told me this story because I asked him about an umbrella or a vision quest. And he said, during the vision quest, you were from running to, just like in racing cars and just like running, those lonely miles where you by yourself and you're faced to deal with yourself, where you didn't thought all your thought, thoughts out. Believe you me, when you up on your feet, bouncing for three hours, and now I'm talking about moving to five hours, and then I'm talking about moving to 10 hours, and I'm talking about moving to 15 hours of running straight on your feet. You run out of little fancy things. You, you run out of questions. You, you run out of com conversations with yourself. You know what I'm saying? And the miles become lonely and, and can, perceived, can be perceived as empty. But those people that are able to embrace those lonely miles 
are the ones that's able to really develop themselves and become better people. And that's what I'm trying to push towards, and hopefully you can push towards that. So keep up with my blog, keep up with my um, radio spot. We're going to be doing more talks, and I'm going to be talking you through as I go through my process of learning, my process of dieting, my process of other exercises. All right, and with that, I say peace. Here's the Jami Pledge, for those that never heard it. I am a Jami man. I was born for greatness. My greatness comes from my potent center, a pledge to find and connect with my center, a pledge to build my spirit, mind, and body, a pledge to use my hands to build a better world for myself, my loved ones, and my community, a pledge to use my mind to think deeper, further, and higher to create a better reality for myself. I pledge to live my life and go beyond all my self-imposed limitations. I pledge to promote the principles of a Jami warrior and to assist all those who are seeking the path of success. I pledge all these things first to myself, my teachers, to all my relations, and to all my and to my higher power. I am Jami. I say, I say, I say. That should be said once a day for all those Jami warriors. With that, I say peace. the hotel. I'm out on my run. This is about mile three. Of course, you know, if you've been following the journey, uh, I have a workout that will release a 360-mile quest that I'm carrying to my readers as well as my tribe members to participate in. You know, in the background, you know, the cars, we're still on course of mile four. And what was supposed to be a half an hour run, but now I'm at about 33 minutes. But while I was running, I was running, I was falling, I was going to fall into a balanced state, what a lot of people call a trance. Because your body working, your mind is set free, a lot of problems that you got, a lot to just drift. Because you can't really necessarily focus on them because of the run, because of the physical output. So, while I was running, I started thinking about this article, or this next piece that we're about to talk about right now. It's called Attitude Adjustment. Now, what did with some pretty brilliant people. You know, you know, I've been truly blessed. But one of the things that I have noticed in my short 43 years, is that attitude, our attitude determines how, how high and how far we go. Why is this? This is because our attitude is what attracts or pushes or repels people away from us. Now, the majority of my life, I have been blessed with some excellent relationships. And these relationships were built and are maintained by the fact that I have a good attitude, or at least I perceive that I have a good attitude. And it's been working for me. And I keep on experimenting with it because, because it has demonstrated to me and for me this fact, it demonstrates that it works. This ain't conjecture, this ain't theory. All my jobs in my life have come as a product of my relationships. And all my relationships have become, come out of, come out of the fact of my attitude. So, one of the things I think that we really need to focus on is helping each other with our attitudes. Now, this is the Achilles heel for most people. This is 
a weak spot. This is a sucker point because most people can't see the attitude. All they see is the result of the attitude. And after a while, they get used to the result because they figure this is how life is. When in fact, their life is a result of the attitude that they're reflecting. So, they need help. They need for us or people outside. We need help. We need for people outside of us to be honest with us about our attitude. And we need to be able to take it. We need to be able to listen and make adjustments if we feel that it's going to take our lives to another level. The issue, the issue is, you could be brilliant, you could be fabulous, you could be marvelous, you could be the next George Washington Carver or have the oratory skills of Marcus Garvey, Martin Luther King, and uh, Obama all rolled up in one. But if your attitude is fucked up, you are going nowhere. So we need to be in the, we need to be people's mirrors. We need to let them know. And those of us that really want to take the time to explore ourselves, we need to look at how people respond to us. Those who we like and those who we don't like. We need to take the feedback and grow. And drop those attitudes that's working against our survival. Because we're coming to a point where relationships are what are not only going to keep you safe, but they're going to keep you alive. And if you are isolating yourself and your family with your stank attitude, you need to correct it now before it's too late. This is Brother High Tim with Jeremy Talks. And today's topic is adjusting your attitude. I'm a mile full. And I'm praying for myself and all those that's listening. With that, I say I say. Peace. This is my last channel. And this segment is called On Mile 3. Let me say that again. I'm on Mile 3. And thoughts hit me when I'm on Mile 3. Now, of course, those that have been following the journey know that I have a 360-mile quest. It's a challenge to see if in a year's time you can cover over 360 miles and your journey to itself. Now let me make this clear. The workout that we're talking about, I don't want the boring workout. I don't want the workout when you ain't having fun and it's all pain and gain. I want you to really get involved with your exercise. I want you to take time during the time that you're doing your quiz and really seek answers in your life. When you run this, it gives you time to think about what's going on. When you go on the road, it gives you time to focus on you and how your body moves. It allows you to find your personal rhythm. This is a spiritual quest. Although using physical means, it's a spiritual quest that you can use to, within a year, make major, major changes in your life. So... Come on the quest with me. So, I'm going to be checking in every now and then, giving inspiration, and talking about some of the thoughts that come across my mind as I'm trying to meditate and pray. Now, one of the things that I'm going to suggest is that when you have problems in your life, that individual people pops up in your meditation or your prayer, is to take a moment, reflect, don't get involved with the thoughts, and whether it's negative or positive about what you're thinking, 
send that person a prayer. Send, pray for that person. And pray for yourself to be able to forgive. Because when we knock him off these miles and knock him off those clouds and knock him off that pain, in order for us to change, we have to let some of the old stuff go. All right? So once again, this is how Tim talking to you about the 360 mile quest challenge. You can join me on gmejourney.blogspot.com and get your form, fill it out every morning, and check out the data as it grow. And look at your progression. Look at your miles and your time increase each time you add. So, one, two, my thought of the day. Oh, by the way, my, my quest is fueled by oxy water. Check it out. Oxy water. Now, here we go. Women, but the most important goddesses were black, not just for the African now, in the civilization of the Greek. The Greek was so profoundly affected by the Africans that the goddess of chastity was a black woman, Artemis. The goddess of wisdom was a black woman, Minerva. The goddess of beauty was a black woman, Diana. And many of their great mythological figures which were critical to the vision of history, the history of the Greeks in the Odyssey, the woman who draws, who has the power to draw Odysseus and all his crew into her, is Circe, who is represented as a black woman with African features on the Greek vases. The woman who helps Jason win the Golden Fleece is a black woman, Medea. The woman who marries Perseus, the Greek hero, is a... To have melanin embedded in our skin is a gift. Oh my gosh, when I say too black, you say too strong. Too black? Too strong? Yeah. When I say too black, you say too strong. Too black.
Beats family, yo, thank you for joining us, right? And I'm thrilled to announce the fact that we are now releasing our first free e-course. Come and learn about Gianni's journey, see some of the stuff we do. Come and join the tribe, tribe up with us, and check out the free e-course. And we'll make sure that the URL pop up right about here, and it'll probably be somewhere in here, Check us out, family, because we are building. Come and learn about Gianni's journey, and let's build together.